God is good. He's to be glorified. That's why we're here today. Let's praise him one more time. Come on, let's go. All right, I, I, I was doing this. I, I, I surveyed 100 people in the lobby before church. And I simply asked this one question. Top seven answers on the board. What is your favorite all-time Christmas movie? Seven, this is what we got. Answers on the board. Come on, let's go. They got to tabulate the answers. That's why. So number seven is this, favorite Christmas movie. Are we working or no? We're not working. Okay, this is when I go to the iPhone. Here it is. Number seven is Miracle on, on 34th Street. We actually found some gray-haired people and some old people who knew what this movie was. <laughs> I, I had no idea what it was, but then um, somebody reminded me that Natalie Wood was in it. Anybody a fan of Natalie Wood and, um, and everything else? So uh, number six, this is actually my favorite. Um, these are my actual notes from when I was talking to you guys, is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. So that's a favorite of mine. Number five, Home Alone. Good Chicago, yes, there it is. Good Chicago classic. Well, if your dad was any kind of dad, he would take you to the house where they filmed that. And you can watch it. You've never seen it. Your dad never took you to that. Are you kidding me? It's right in Waukegan. I mean, geez, come on. Okay, number four, you're going to love this. Are we, okay, we're working. Anything with Candace Cameron on Hallmark Channel. Isn't that true? Like, like that, that, okay, I, I lied. I didn't take the surveys. My daughter said that. And, and, and so anything with Candace Cameron, she has done 10 movies on Hallmark Channel. She is called the Queen of Christmas. But what you learn in church, she has just left Hallmark. Did you realize this? She's, you guys know everything. <laughs> How, like, this is like, okay, so you went to the great American movie channel, so you have to find her on there. Number three, let's get through this, A Christmas Story. Another favorite of mine. Anybody remember this one? It was actually filmed in my hometown. You can go to the house. It's actually a museum. Second one is this, Elf. Huge favorite, for sure. And then, can you guess what the top one is? Somebody just said Die Hard. I actually had it on the list, and I'm like, it's not a Christmas movie that has died. That's an old joke, and, but it isn't. Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. What is the one? Yes, come on. Let's put Yeah, we already put it up there. So these are our favorite Christmas movies, your favorite. Set all that to simply say this. What do they have in common? Well, they make us laugh. They make us cry. They make us experience a little bit of joy. Wouldn't you agree? except for Die Hard. That's what they do. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about. So if you have a Bible, open it up to John chapter 15. If not, no problem. We're going to put the verses on the screen. I want to welcome everybody here, all those that are at home, those that are with us in person. Maybe this is your first time here. We're so grateful that you chose to spend this service and Christmas with us. And I want to talk to you about Red Letter Christmas. And so what we've been talking about with Red Letter Christmas is we mean the words of Jesus. Oftentimes in the Bible that his words are printed in red letters. And I want to bring to you a message about joy. And so this message comes from this one verse. I want us to experience the fullness of God's joy together this Christmas to make sure that we do it. So I want to give you five biblical truths about joy. Three of them are going to come from this one verse. So let me ask you to do this. We don't do this often. As a sign of unity and for the respect to God's word, let's stand together, and I want to read God's verse. We're going to read it together. It's from John chapter 15, verse 11. These are Jesus' words to us this day on this Christmas season. Let's read together. Begin with me. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you that we can worship you here today. Thank you for what we've already experienced as I can sense your presence. We know that your word, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by your word, and I pray that our faith would grow, that our joy would increase as we study your word together today. If you agree with that prayer, simply say amen. amen. You may be seated. Five biblical truths about joy. 
the first truth is this. If you're a note taker, you can write this down, that joy is, okay, we're going to, we're, there we go. Joy is supernatural. So it's not something that you can buy at Walmart. It's not something that you can order at Amazon. It's supernatural. It's from God. That's the first thing that we see. Now, Jesus says, first part of the verse, these things. And so he's talking about these things. And so what are these things? We flashed already to it. It's the first part of the chapter. I want to take a look at the context. So look with me at verse 1 of John 15. And what Jesus does is he gives us a picture of our relationship with him. It's a lasting picture of your relationship with God. Probably in all of scripture, the whole of the Bible, this is the best description of what it looks like for you to know God and to be in relationship with him. And it tells us exactly about this joy that we're going after, this supernatural joy. Look with me at verse one. I'm gonna read Jesus's words. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it would bear more fruit. He goes on to say, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. And here it is, he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. It says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that will bear much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, my word abides in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, verse 8, my Father is glorified, that you would bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. And as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commands and abide in his love. And then we get to the verse. These things, all that, this picture, I have spoken to you, Jesus is speaking to us, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So the context here is this wonderful picture that you and I are to be like branches and we're to be plugged in to the vine. So I've got a picture of it, if we can put it on the screen. This is Jesus, he's the vine, and we're like these branches that are plugged in, getting all our nutrients and everything we need from him. As I read all those verses, the word abide is used 11 times in our English Bibles. In the original language, it's actually 12 times. Abide, 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 abide. What, what does that mean? Well, it literally means to make your home in. So we, in order to experience joy, are to make our home in Jesus, that we're to be properly connected to the vine, that when that happens, we abide and we produce fruit. And so fruit, it's used eight times in those verses that I read. Everybody tracking? One person tracking. Are we all tracking? Yes. Carry this section, please. You guys over here good? We got some people up there. Are we good? We're abiding. That's making our home in him. That's the picture of what it means to be plugged in. And then we're producing fruit. Fruit's talked about eight times. Fruit is the change in character and conduct that comes to us because we abide. So joy, said all that to say this, is a byproduct of abiding and fruitfulness. That's how we get joy. That's why it's supernatural. We can't experience it unless we're plugged into the vine. I don't want you to be this. Look at this picture. I don't want you to be a branch that's been broken off from the vine. This is just a stick. A stick has no life. A stick isn't getting what it needs from the vine. A stick is dead and ready to be burned. And so for us to experience joy, it's different from happiness. Catch this, happiness and joy, two very different things. Happiness comes from the word happenstance, 
Happenstance means by choice, by accident, by luck. Joy is the opposite of this. Happenstance is that it depends on my circumstances, what's happening around me. Joy, it's happening apart from my circumstance, what's happening in me. Do you get it? Happiness. I'm all for happiness, but happiness is dependent upon what's happening, what they said, what you did, what this is happening, what's going on in the news, what's happening here. It's dependent on outside circumstances. Physically, joy, it's independent of what's going on outside of us. It's dependent on what's happening inside of us, spiritually. That's the difference. That's what's led to this definition for us. Let's put it up on the board. Joy is a supernatural delight. It's in the presence of God and in the purposes of God and the people of God. That's joy. We have joy in the presence of Almighty God. Have you experienced joy today? As we sensed God's presence here? That, that's joy. It wasn't just happiness. I mean, we're happy, but joy is deep within it's a response and a delight in God and his purposes and his plan and, and his people. That, that's what brings true joy. And so that's why I say it's supernatural. And so I want you to experience the fullness of God's joy. It's not only supernatural, but the second thing is this. It's transferable. So this joy is transferable to us. Hey, I don't want you to do this, but have you ever passed on a yawn? Anyone? I'm going to not do it. I don't want to do it now because then you're going to do it, and then it's going to be like, oh, this message is pretty boring. <laughs> but when you pass on a yawn, what are you doing? You're transferring it to someone else. And, and Jesus, just like we pass on a yawn, he, he passes on joy. It, it, just, it just gets transferred to us. It's, it's, it's contagious. And so again, one verse today. I wanted to make it easy on Christmas. Anybody? And one verse, but let's look at the next phrase. Jesus says, my joy. Now when he says my, that's a personal pronoun. How many English majors in the room? My hand goes down. We have one over here. And, and so that's personal pronoun. It's, it's mine and mine, mine, mine. And so this is Jesus that he gives to us. He gives this supernatural delight. And interestingly, if you double-click on this word joy in the original language, oftentimes I say that, and people say, what's well, the original language? Well, the New Testament was written in, in Greek, and it's written in Koine Greek, which is language that's not spoken anymore. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And so if you look at this word in its original language, joy, it's the same word that gives us grace. Isn't that interesting? So joy and grace are united. And grace is that I get what I don't deserve. Joy comes through grace because I don't deserve it either. But God gives me this supernatural delight in him. And because of his goodness, because of his grace, because of his loving kindness, because of his forgiveness, that, that I can experience something apart from my outside circumstances. I can experience something in my heart because I delight in God's presence. I delight in God's purposes. I delight in God's people. That, that's the joy. And so Jesus is like, I want to give you something you don't have. I want it to be in you. Good stuff so far? So the question is this. How do we get more of it? I mean, if I took a survey, anybody buying today? I, I want more of this, don't you? I, I want more joy. I, like, I got this going on, and this is happening, and you don't know what's happening to my family. I wish I could have some more joy. H how do you get it? So glad you asked. Time for a quick Bible study. We're going to go through this quickly. There's a lot here. The Bible reveals to us a lot of verses on how we can be filled with Jesus' joy. That's what we're going for. Jesus' joy. This is how we get it. Let me begin with this. Joy comes through salvation. 
that comes through the relationship being plugged into the vine. That's the picture that I showed you already. David says in Psalm 51, restore to me the joy of salvation, that I'm in right relationship with you. How else does joy come? Joy comes through unity. The scripture says, complete my joy by being of the same mind in Philippians. Paul says, have the same love, being in full accordance and of one mind. So we in the church need to be experiencing more joy as we're united together. How come the world's not experiencing joy? Well, because it's so divided. Joy comes from a unity of mind. How else does joy come? Joy comes through praise. And we experience that today. And the shadow of your wings, I will sing for joy. That we experience joy, that supernatural delight in him through praise and through worship. Next, joy comes through new beginnings. Joy comes through fresh starts. Joy comes through that new lease on life that God gives you fresh starts every single day. It says in Psalm 30 at the end of verse 5, but joy comes with the morning that we can wake up and no matter what happened yesterday, it's a new day, it's a fresh day, that God's going to give us joy as we call out to him. Joy comes, it comes through service. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. Paul's talking about an individual who nearly died for the work of Christ. So this guy worked himself to the point where he was almost dead. People were coming after him, all this, and he says he risked his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. A little bit of a rebuke. He's like, be like this guy. And, and joy comes through, through service. We've already said it. I mean, yesterday here at this location, it's the best thing we do, Care Center Christmas. Was it awesome? I mean, did we already talk about it? Over 3,000 gifts or children were ministered to that, that they're going to receive a gift this Christmas. Um, I'm so proud of so, our, how our church responded. And it was just awesome at this location. I mean, the place was packed and up on the third floor. And, and so I was sitting with a table and getting to know some of the people. And, and my whole family served. And, and what was funny was uh, Jody told me this story this morning. And there was somebody there w with, their, with their kid. And, and they said, you know, they said, well, you know, um, they looked at their mom and they said, you know, so they said, mom, is it okay if we go to church more and swimming lessons less? <laughs> That's what he got out of it. So he didn't have to go to swimming lessons yesterday. And he came to church. and He's like, I want to do more church, less swimming. And so <laughs> service brings joy, does it not? That when we serve him, that, that, that we get involved in his work, that we do what he wants, that there comes joy. Let's keep going. We've got a lot more here. Joy comes through belief. This is probably the most important one to start the relationship. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Stop for a moment. Maybe this is the first time here. Maybe you haven't been to church for a while. Maybe, like me, you went to a church where you would read a creed and, and, and you would respond. And, and believing is more than just intellectual consent. I want to help you understand this, that believing involves my head and my heart and my hands. That's New Testament belief. So not only do I need to know some things about who Jesus is, I need to have some information downloaded in my head, and then I got to have some, some emotion deposited in my heart that I understand what this guy Jesus did for me, that he hung on the cross, that he died for me, that he paid the penalty of my sins. And has that brought a tear to your eye? Deposited in the head, downloaded in the heart, and displayed in your hands that what I believe and what I feel about my faith, it actually changes what I do and, and how I respond and how I serve. That's belief and that brings joy. Next, Joy comes through adversity. And so maybe you're going through a hard time. And I can't explain it. I wish I, I wish I had the formula for this. But even in the worst of moments, God can be there in an instant. In the most difficult pain, God can be there in a moment. When she left, or he's doing that, or this happened to me, or the business went down in flames. In our worst of the worst, we can have joy because it's independent 
of the circumstance. Because Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, God's spirit in you, despite the matter of fact of what that person did, despite the length of what you lost, you can have joy. It comes through difficulty. And joy comes through intimacy. That's the key. And, and because why? Because in your presence, there is fullness of joy. So no matter what's happening around me, in, in his presence, when, when I'm experiencing him, that, that's going to bring joy. It overshadows. The volume goes up. We, we forget for a moment about all these things. And God's presence brings joy. A few more. God's joy comes through discipleship. This is a favorite of mine in 3 John. And as a dad with my kids, as a pastor to our church, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That's what John said, the apostle, when he was in his 90s, that no matter what was happening as a father sitting here or as a mom, that that your kids walking in the truth, that, that brings the ultimate joy. And another one, how about this? Joy comes through obedience. Here we look to Jesus in Hebrews chapter 12, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That's what Jesus did. Let us not forget that, yes, Christmas had to come. The baby had to be born. He was born in a manger, yes, and, and great joy came to Mary and Joseph, and and he grew to become a man. He, he took the cross, and through the most difficult time, he endured the cross. And for the joy that was set before him, he despised the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And Jesus brings joy to us. He experienced joy through the pain because of his obedience to God. And so despite what's happening around you, take that step of faith that God wants you to take. Man, forgive that person. Man, get involved in that person's life to help them. Share Jesus. I mean, do the things that God wants. Obedience is simply doing what God wants when he wants it done. A lot of us do what God wants. Amen? But we do it on our timetable. Is that a little convicting? It is for me. Because we don't want to do it in the instant. And he wants you to do it when he wants it done. And, and that brings joy. So that's a long Bible study. Whew. Man, that was a lot. I'm tired. I think I'm going to sit down. Can we just end this thing right now? No, we've got some more things to talk about joy. Are you refreshed? Reset. That's how you get it. Third thing is this, that joy is transformational. So I said all that to say that's how God funnels joy into your heart, mind, and soul. And this is what happens next, is that it's transformational. Because Jesus says in John chapter 15, at the end of verse 11, that your joy, so you got a little bit in you, it, it may be full. Now what's interesting about this word in its original language, three English words come from one Greek word. What's interesting, it means to be complete, to render perfect. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're perfect. Even if you don't believe it. No, we're not all perfect yet, but, but to be complete, to be perfect, that's what joy brings. So who's up for a little more fun on Christmas? Okay, so this is what we got here. So let me show you some pictures, and show, let me show you this first picture. This movie didn't make it into our thing. Like, uh, uh, what was this movie called? Uh, Griswold, yeah, that's uh, Griswold is... Clark Griswold. And so imagine Clark Griswold's house without these lights. I mean, it's incomplete. At Christmas it is. How about this next one? This is, imagine this tree without these ornaments. And I actually took this when I was visiting Pastor Craig's house. This is, he's got this whole thing. I was like, but this is like weird, Craig. I mean, it is, and he's got the reindeer. And, and it's just like, I'm like, man, this is over. Sorry, I had to say it, Craig. But, but um. But, but the next picture, <laughs> and so th this is actually uh, over at CJ's house. I was over there. And, 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 and so, so what would this, what is this? This is the shelf with the elf. What would this shelf be without the elf? I mean, CJ, it's so good that you had that up. And, 
And then this is my house right here. I just took this picture. And this is my stoop. And so what would this stoop be without Snoop? I mean, what would it be? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I mean, what would this be? I'm just being honest. You know, let's get rid of that real quick. I, I'm being judged right now. And so, so, so this, this is a literally, this is an actual picture. Okay, I don't want an email that wasn't my house. It was Craig's though. And, and so, so, so this actually went viral. And maybe you saw this on the news. It's a, a woman in UK. And look at this, look at this presence, man. It's like bigger than the house. And what would this tree be like without these presents? Well, it would be incomplete. Now, I don't know if you're going to have that many. But, but that's what it looks like for us to not have joy. We're incomplete. We're, we're not perfect. We're, we're lacking something significant, something of great significance. So I want to slow down. I want to be as practical as we can we got how many shopping days till Christmas? Seven. Seven. Good. Is that right? Five, you got it done yet? Six? Eight? Well, come on, guys. What? Don't, we don't know. It's, <laughs> it's coming next Sunday. I mean, what is happening? I, I get picked. People are going four, five. Like, like what is with you people? I, it, listen, I want you to six. Thank you very much. I, I'll be working on this for next s- service, and I will get the right number. And, and I want you to experience the fullness of joy this Christmas this month. But if we're honest, our joy gets stolen, doesn't it? And there's some joy leaks that that we leak what we want. And so I want to give you a few things. These are what I'm calling five joy stealers at Christmas. And so the first one is comparison. When we begin to compare ourselves to others, we're, we're, we're leaking the joy. It, It steals our joy. I love how Mark Twain put it. He said, comparison is the death of joy. It's gone. How about this next one? It's criticism. Maybe you've heard the proverb, death by a thousand cuts. That's the person who just keeps ripping on you. and cut, Like never, zero encouragement. And, and, and that takes away our joy. Don't, don't be that person. How about this quote? I'm just going to share some quotes with you. These are just people that said some really good things about these particular topics and Shannon Alder says, often those that criticize others reveal what they themselves lack. How about this next one? Anybody struggling with this? Perfectionism. Jody and I have a very good friend, and she's an adult now. We know her mom, and she would say that when she was a kid, her mom, she would make the bed trying to please her mom, And then you know what her mom would do? She would go to school, and her mom would remake the bed because it wasn't done just right. And so this girl, as an adult, still, it's like that had an effect on her. What beds are you remaking? And in the idea that it's got to be perfect, it, it, it does more harm than good. And so I love this quote, perfectionism is not a quest for the best. It's a pursuit of the worst in ourselves, the part that tells us that nothing we do will ever be good enough that we should try again. Another joy stealer. How about this one, jealousy? I mean, that's a pretty obvious one, that, that, that I'm jealous. And the jealous, William Penn says, are troublesome to others, but a torment to themselves. I mean, these are the things that steal our joy. I mean, we're listening to people who are talking about the things that steal our joy that may not even be experiencing the fullness of the joy that I'm telling you about. Lastly, love this quote, distraction. And here we'll go to Warren Buffett, and here's a guy that has experienced great joy in giving his fortune away. That's how he would say, I've experienced joy, through his generosity. I mean, it's, it's unheard of what he's done, and And he says the most dangerous distractions are the ones that you love, but that don't love you back. Isn't it true? These are the joy stealers. These are the things that cause our joy to leak. These are the things that take away our joy at Christmas. Let's make sure that we're filled with his joy. 
next biblical truth? Joy is attainable. Stop for a moment. You can get it. Your cup can runneth over. Like, it is attainable. We've looked at a number of different ways, but let's not neglect what Jesus says in John chapter 16. If we just flip the page and verse 24, and Jesus says, until now, red letters. Hey, you guys haven't asked for anything, he says to his disciples. In my name, that's the key, my name reveals that I'm properly plugged in. Remember the picture of the vine and the branches? That you're plugged into the vine. He says, ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. He wants to maximize your joy. All you got to do is ask. Another red letter verse. Jesus says, if you, if you want some bread, my father's just ask. My father's not going to give you, he's not going to give you a stone. So I wonder in this Christmas season, excuse me, I wonder if we were more on our knees and, and we got rid of all the hustle and bustle and instead of getting everything done, if we just asked and and bowed down and prayed, I wonder if that would bring us more joy. Just wondering. Jesus says, ask, and you'll receive. And so this is a prayer that I wrote that I've been praying this week, and I'm asking God for more joy for myself personally because I can get sidetracked, and my joy can leak because of all those things. So this is my prayer Maybe it will be helpful to you. Lord, you are merciful and good. You are kind and tenderhearted. You are loving and forgiving. You are sovereign and in control. You know my sin, my shame, my struggles. You know my insecurities, my weaknesses, and my fears. You know my disappointments, my discouragement, and my lack of contentment. Yet you long to fill me with your joy this Christmas. If there's anything in me that is preventing me from experiencing the fullness of your joy, please reveal it to me. Give me the strength to address it, to confess it, and to correct it, correct it. Because joy comes regardless of my circumstances. Joy comes as a result of my relationship with God. Joy comes through Jesus, God's one and only Son. Help me to experience your joy inwardly, so that I can exhibit your joy outwardly and extend your joy faithfully to others. The scripture says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Make your joy my strength. Make your joy our strength this Christmas, I pray in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen. 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 Joy is attainable through God as we call out to him. Lastly, joy is unforgettable. So it, it's like you, you can't forget it. Like you may not be experiencing the fullness of it right now in this moment, but you can think back and look back in the rearview mirror of what God did, and it brings you amazing, amazing joy. It's unforgettable, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstance. I remember when um, we had our third daughter, and Jody was pregnant, and we had just started the church. And I got the phone call that um, nobody ever wants to get. I got it from Jody's uh, brother-in-law, and he called and said that Jody's dad had just died unexpectedly. And so I had to tell Jody, and like she was, like our daughter was due in a few days. And so we literally, um, we went in and had her induced. And so we did that so that we could go and fly home for the funeral. And so um, it, it was just crazy. I mean, we had like this, you know, this little baby on, well, our babies are not little. <laughs> but, but we had this, you know, we, we, we took this, and, and, you know, and people are looking at us on the airport, and, you know, and they just knew something must be wrong. And we were given the permission to fly with this little newborn. And, and despite Jody losing her dad, and you can imagine the grief that that brought, and as she was going through pregnancy and I mean she if she was up here she would describe to you that although she lost her dad that 
when she had Emily, that, that even in the midst of that difficulty, like she experienced joy. And so we actually named our third daughter Emily Joy because of the supernatural delight that you can experience despite your circumstances that you can experience despite your surroundings. That as we look at Emily Joy, joy is a delight in what God can do, in who God is, in what he does that's beyond our comprehension. That no matter your circumstance, no matter the pain, no matter the loss, no matter the grief, no matter the death, God wants to bring joy. It's attainable, and it's unforgettable because it's unexplainable. It, it's from him. And so let's end with Luke chapter 2. And this is the shepherd's story where the angel came and said to the shepherd, Fear not, first Christmas morning, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That's the great joy, is the good news that God sent his son. And I love this, it will be for all people. Every age, every race, every color, every, every no matter what your uh, W-2 says, no matter what side of the tracks you were born on, that, that, that this great joy, the good news, is for every nation, every tribe, every tongue. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He's the one that brings the joy. He distributes it to you and to me. So before we close, I, wanna, I want you to hear from some people who've experienced the joy. And so we've been doing baptism this month, and maybe you've seen some of these, maybe you haven't, that all of our locations, we've been baptizing people, and people are They've experienced this joy, and, and I want you to hear from them. But as you watch this clip of some of the people verbalizing the joy that they've experienced, I, I just don't want you to think about them. I want you to think about you. And as you're listening to them, ask yourself, are you experiencing the fullness of God's joy? And then Pastor Craig's going to come up, and he's going to challenge us to grab hold and experience God's joy to the fullest. Take a look at these stories. That I'm not even that person anymore. And so the person that you see standing before you today is someone that I've never been before and I am so grateful for who I am. I love myself, I have confidence, I have joy. My cup is not just half full, it runneth over and over and over. Being my life to that point, making decisions on my own, being my own God, I'd gotten to the point where I wanted to take my life. If anybody's out there and they're on the fence, I want you to know that Jesus Christ is real. If he can save me, he can save anyone. And I'm also here to testify that Christ is living in me. I could feel it. He's, he moves my heart. I had went through a lot of trauma, sexual trauma, um, verbal abuse at home and at church and at school. And um, I was very angry, I was secretive, I was very manipulative, and I got to a place to where I just had no hope, and that's when the Lord found me. It was these past few months as my brother Caden came home from college, um, he started questioning God. At that time he was an atheist, um, at most he said he was agnostic, and I started asking those same questions and it, it just started strengthening my faith. That you don't have to conform to the patterns of this world that you can find a greater satisfaction, which is in Jesus Christ. If we claim to have a relationship with God and yet live in darkness, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. And that was me. But you know, God didn't leave me hanging three verses down. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's what he did for me when I cried out to him. <laughs>